Late last year, I produced an episode of DF Retro on Pitfall the Mayan Adventure, and I found that one of its defining features was its hand-drawn animation produced by Croyer Films, the animation studio behind features such as Ferngully, The Last Rainforest. Now, thanks to friend of the show, Sal Carrero, I had an opportunity to speak with Bill Croyer himself over Skype a few weeks back. Bill has a tremendous history in both hand-drawn and computer-generated animation, which just happens to be a topic of great interest to me as a fan of animation. So this is a different kind of video then. For the next hour or so, Bill joins us to share a wealth of information on his career, from working on Pitfall back in the day with Activision to creating computer-generated imagery for use in 1982's Tron, and a whole lot more. I managed to get a few questions in, but he has a lot of interesting things to share, so without further delay, let's get started. I guess to get started then, why don't you uh, fill people in a little bit on your background? Like, how did you get into animation uh, and eventually computer animation before we actually get into the game? My name is Bill Croyer. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and I was never allowed to take art as a kid because my father was a factory worker and didn't think artists could make a living. So it really forbid me from doing it, although I love to draw. So I turned my creative energy to writing and I became a journalism major. And I went to Northwestern University, which is an important journalism school in the United States. But all I did was do cartoons for the school paper. <laughs> and I cartooned for four years. And then my senior year, I had to do a short film for an advertising class. So I thought I would make a cartoon film because nobody else was going to do that. And I went to the bookstore and I got the Preston Blair book on animation, which by the way is the book that everyone in my generation learned from. <laughs> and I sat down and I said, okay, animated film, you do a, do a drawing, you change it a little, you take a picture, you do another one, change it a little. And I did this little animated film of a snake with a hat on. And I sent that film to the drugstore. This is 1972. And it, two days later, the Super 8 film came back and I put it on the projector. And when I saw the little character come to life and turn around and look at me and wink, I got, that was it. That, I was hooked on animation. The fact that I had created a life completely hooked me. And from that day, I never thought of anything but animation. So I taught myself how to animate, and weirdly enough, I sold myself as an animator to the local college and started doing educational films. And I did that for three years, and then in 75, Chuck Jones came to Chicago oh, wow. and to a film festival, and I brought my Super 8 projector to him, and Chuck, being the sweetest guy in the world, said, yeah, all right, I'll look at it. So he looked at one of my stupid educational films, and he looked at it, and he said, you did this all by yourself without any training? And I said, yeah. He says, I think you actually have the talent to be an animator. You should come to Hollywood. So wow. based solely on Chuck Jones' recommendation, because he was the first person I ever met in animation other than myself, I got in my van and I drove out to Hollywood and um, Chuck was here and I said, hey Chuck, remember me, I'm here. And he goes, hey, good luck. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but I went around town and I, I interviewed at seven, it's all 17 studios at that time, in 1975, there were like 17 animation studios. I went to all of them and I got turned on by all of them and then finally, just when I was about ready to get back in my van and leave, somebody called me and said, you want to work for minimum wage? And I said, yes. And I took a job at Spun Buggy as an in-betweener. And that was how I started my career in animation. And I uh, worked my way up to be an animator in commercials. And then when I got pretty good in commercials, I took my reel to Disney, which was everyone's goal. Yep. And as luck would have it, and this is pure luck, wouldn't have happened any other time in the century. I happened to walk into Disney with my reel the same time they were looking at all the reels from CalArts. They were gonna let all these young guys into the new training program. And so they said, well, this guy can animate. He didn't go to art school, but he can animate because he's got a commercial reel. And they let me in. And so I go into the room with John Musker and Brad Bird and Henry Selleck, and wow. we start training together. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was how I began my Disney career. And so we had the greatest time uh, as young animators, we trained under Eric Larson, one of the Nile men, and we worked under Wooly, who was directing, you know, Fox and the Hound. And we, and we, or, or, what was he doing at that time? Yeah, Wooly was there, and well, Frank and Ollie were writing the book, you know. 
So anyway, it was an amazing, magical time to be a, to train in the classic Disney tradition at the Disney studio. It was like a absolutely miraculous time. And I did that for several years, animated on Fox and Hound, and then they were going to do Black Cauldron, and I hated that idea. <laughs> and a guy named Steve Lisberger came to Hollywood, and he said, I'm doing a movie called Animal Olympics, which would like to be my animation director. And I went, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I left Disney, and I went to Lisberger. And I became animation director of Animal Olympics, which was a lot of fun. And we had, every time Disney would fire somebody, I'd hire him. So they fired Brad Bird, and I hired him, you know. And we had Roger Aller set up directing The Lion King. And we had, wow. you know, <laughs> that's, we had an amazing crew on Animal Olympics. And uh, we did that, and as we were finishing it, we developed a, a really innovative movie that we didn't think had much of a chance, but it was called Tron. It was a movie about computers. Guys yes, inside a computer. Of course. And weirdly enough, we sold that to Disney, and I went back to Disney as animation director of Tron. And uh, so Jerry Reese and I stored, storyboarded the entire movie, and then we did all the animation on that movie, and that's how I got the computer graphics. So anyway, ah. face, you know, I stayed in the computer industry after Tron, and then my wife and I started Courier Films, which has our own company, and I developed this new technique to combine hand-drawn animation, which I, I missed. I, I loved computers, but they couldn't do character. So I came up with a way to do computer imagery and print it out on animation paper so I can combine it with hand-drawn animation on paper. And that was what we did at Courier Films, and we did Technological Threat, and got an Oscar nomination, and did lots of film titles like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and Christmas Vacation, and Pink Panther. And then these guys came to town from Australia and said, we have a feature called Fern Gully. Would you yes. like to make the feature? And we said, yeah, we'll do that. So made Fern Gully and that was a tremendous uh, uh, amount of fun. And, and after that, everybody wanted to make features. And so we started to get enticed by the studios to join the studio. And so Sue and I decided to close Carter Films. And we, were, we went into Warner Brothers with a deal to direct a movie there. And I stayed there for a couple of years in development. but. I didn't get along with the management there. I didn't really mm. agree on taste. So I left that studio. And sure enough, the movie they did after that became the worst movie ever made. Uh, statistically, the lowest grossing film in history. So I was good to get out of there. But ironically, I had these friends at Rhythm and Hughes who I'd known since they found Rhythm and Hughes. And I went down there to direct a commercial and I stayed there for 12 years. Wow. I became station director at Rhythm and Hughes and did movies like, you know, Cats and Dogs and Scooby-Doo and Garfield and I was animation director of all those movies. And then in 2010, um, out of the blue, I get a call from Chapman University about um, starting an animation visual effects division of their film school. And I liked the idea. I was re ready to make the change. And so I took that position and that's what I've been doing ever since. So. It's my ninth year at Chapman, so it's been a very exciting uh, kind of second chapter. So that, in a nutshell, is my That's, background. That is quite now, the in background. The middle, of, <laughs> in the middle of all that, right at that period where I mentioned we started to do the combining the computer animation with the hand-drawn animation, that was the period before Fern Gully where my studio was doing a lot of commercial work, and we did Kellogg's commercials, and we did training films and we did all these different things and it was at that moment when we were approached by the activision to do a video game that was going to be a remake of the classic pitfall harry game and they had seen our work and we were the only studio that had real disney animators working outside of disney and bobby kodak who was the chairman at that time he wanted to do something really different he wanted the highest quality 2d animation he could get for this new game and he looked all around town and he finally decided we were the ones because we were the one studio that had Disney quality animation outside of Disney and we'd work on a project. And so Bobby and his partner Howard Marks came over to our house and had dinner with Sue and me and they pitched us on this idea. And we really liked those guys. And you could tell from meeting them that their energy was amazing. And so we decided to work with them on Pitfall Harry, and that was how that began. The beginning of the project was very much like a traditional project. It was all storyboarded. You know, they came in with the concepts and the layouts and the situations, and we boarded kind of how the character would move through the environments, and we, you know, basically got approvals on posing. 
And the actual animation of the character was also pretty traditional. You know, in those days, we still worked on paper, you know, with a punched animation paper on an animation desk. And we animated, of course, you had to be very precise, you know, with the consistency of the size of the character, and you had to be very precise moving him within the constraints of the layouts. But that was all, those were skill sets that we always had as traditional animators. But what was very different about the Pitfall Harry job was the fact that we were animating what we called modules of motion because we had to animate in and out of multiple options. So when a character did a, an animated movement, at the end of that movement, he had to be able to go into three or four different kinds of movements that the player would choose, but those transitions had to look seamless. Right. And that was, that was the challenge for doing Pitfall Harry. And also you had to have a situation where your character could do cycles. You know, it's like he was spinning down a vine. You had to animate that spin so it would hook right into the same thing and you could script that so that the modules would go together and the character could spin six or seven times and it would all be seamless. When he got to the bottom, he could hop down and he could decide to run left, he could run right, he could jump, he could do reach out. And all those things had to be animated, you know. So it was, an, it was, it was a, a very different job for us, you know, because you, that was very, that was not done, of course, in traditional narrative animation. Narrative animation, you're animating just one set of scenes. But the uniqueness about the Pitfall Harry job was the fact that you animated modules of motion you had to keep the character on model. You had to keep the character in his personality, but you had to um, cleverly pose the finish and start of each scene so that it looked like it was going to be a seamless blend. And that was a something different. Yeah, I can imagine because you know responsiveness is key there. And if you have to wait for an animation to play out, then you lose kind of control of the character. So, I guess being able to snap in and out of all those different animations that's quite a restriction there. Well, you don't want the player to be to have their fantasy interrupted. You know? Right. The, the player wants to feel like they're in a continuous movement. And that was the artistry of it. It wasn't so much, you know, obviously the Activision engineers solved the technical side of that. They were able to have, you know, the sprites lined up so that technically they would pop into the next choice. But the artistry from our end was, of course, having the poses because you know in animation you create momentum, you have arcs, you have you know paths of action of every part of the character. And the, the, the little three-dimensional puzzle was how do you make it look like the motion is transitioning smoothly into multiple options with the same motion? And that was a very interesting problem. You know, it was actually a lot of fun to to do. You know. So did you get to communicate much then with the with the programming team? Because obviously those systems at the time were very constrained in terms of how much data you could display at once and the size of the characters and also the number of colors you could use in a character. I mean, how did that impact uh, your art from when you're creating these uh, characters? We just had one or two very thorough kickoff meetings with the technical team because you know, remember, this is pretty early in game, the gaming development world. And yeah. so the options weren't that many. You know, they explained to us uh, exactly how it would work and how the transitions would be working. And the color and everything, they, of course, what was different about this is we were only going to supply the cleaned up pencil drawings. They were going to scan those, digitize them. They were going to, you know, pixel, pixel paint them within the game. So we didn't have to deliver color, you know. Mm. We just did color models for them to follow, but then they did all the painting within the game. So all we had to do, once we understood, you know, the actions, we understood the, the branching options, we just had to keep track of all that and then deliver all those things. And we had to, of course, of course label them correctly so they could understand them and arrange it that way. We, we had constant interaction, of course, with the uh, creative directors at Activision because we actually this is before the internet of course and so we'd actually go down there with uh you know with videotape and we'd show them the pencil tests and they would sit there and, and comment on them and it was interesting because their one creator had no experience whatsoever in character animation and she gave me what i considered to be maybe the greatest note i've ever gotten as an animation director i showed her this run cycle of pitfall hair and she's looking at it and she's scratching her chin and she goes um can you make it younger? <laughs> 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 I 
younger? How do you how do you make it younger? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we made it bouncier. She liked it. Yeah, actually, the run cycle in that game it really stands out still today. It looks great with the motion of the character. One thing, though, that I noticed when I was researching the game, I noticed that Activision first revealed the game as called Pitfall Harry, the Mayan Adventure, and they showed it at the Consumer Electronics Show. And at that show, the first time they showed it, I believe, uh, it had a different visual style than what uh, ended up shipping in the game. Like, Harry himself looked rather different, and the background art was quite different. And then there was a point, like, months later where they showed it again and it looked more like what we ended up with and i'm wondering did you have anything to do with that initial build or do you know if that was like they were testing the game out and then they're like okay we want to do this animation work now and then brought you guys in or i, I don't know i don't know i know that but i know the pitfall harry stuff that was shown at ces in vegas was the, our animation was included in that but it was still kind of a prototype uh, moment yeah, I saw a, I saw a demo reel actually with the finished Pitfall Harry sprite, uh, and it featured a lot of additional animation that was not actually in the game, and I thought it was really neat to see, because uh, you can see just how much animation was created then for him. And obviously, you know, with memory restrictions, there's only so much they could actually ship, but uh, it's uh, that's that's a cool piece to see. I'm pretty sure we did all that all that work because they were very happy with our work. And Bobby and Mark Harold especially really liked us. And, you know, we had a great relationship with them. I have a funny story about that CES convention in Vegas. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Steve Wynn was half owner of Activision. And, mm -hmm. and Steve Wynn is, you know, is, is Mr. Las Vegas. He's the guy that revitalized Las Vegas in the 80s. He built the Mirage Hotel, you know, and then he built the, the Bellagio. He was like the most powerful man in Vegas. And uh, strangely, you know, he had, he's the one that financed Activision. Huh. Bobby and Bobby Kotek and Harold Marks lived in New York City when they had the idea to start their video game company. And it was a very fledgling idea, a very fledgling business uh, plan. And they were trying to find money. And Bobby flew to Dallas to go to a, a, a video game convention and try to find backing. And it was a very small convention and he had no luck at all. And he was at breakfast in the hotel and he was staying in the Hyatt, like a nice hotel. And he literally backed his chair into this guy having breakfast. And it was Steve Wynn. And they started to chat. And Steve Wynn, being very gregarious, said, what are you doing here, kid? And Bobby said, I'm trying to sell a video game. And Steve Wynn had never heard of that. He said, what, what are you talking about? And Bobby started to describe it. And Steve Wynn said, um, he said, well, I'm interested in this. Where, where do you live? And Bobby says, well, I'm, I live in New York City. I'm going back. And Steve goes, well, perfect. I'm going back to New York this afternoon. Why don't you come with me on my private jet? So Bobby <laughs> flew with Steve Wynn on his private jet. And on the jet ride back to New York, he pitched Steve Wynn on starting at the Activision Game Company. And they land in New York. And Steve Wynn says, OK, I'll think about this. Where are you going to be tomorrow morning at 11? And Bobby says, well, I'll be with my partner, Howard. And he says, fine. Um, I'll call you. So he gets home and he tells Howard he's very excited. I met this guy from Vegas and he's got a, and he's got a casino in Atlantic City and la da da da. So eleven o'clock, Howard and Bobby are sitting in their apartment. The phone rings and it's Steve and he says, "Go down to the front door." So they go down to the front door of their apartment building and there's a limousine waiting. And they get in the limousine and it drives to the helicopter pad at the East River, and they get into a helicopter and they fly to Atlantic City. And another limousine takes them to the casino and they're ushered into Steve Wynn's office. And Steve Wynn says, OK, I've, I've thought about your pitch. I, I, I'll, I'd like to partner with you guys who are willing. And here's the deal. I put up all the money. You do all the work. It's 50 50. And they look at each other and they go, well, that sounds great. Well, we'll do the contracts. And Steve Wynn holds out his hand and he goes, here's the contract. And they shook hands, and that was the beginning of Activision. Oh, wow, so, that's crazy. So here you have Steve Wynn, this huge player, who's like Mr. Vegas, right? So we go to Vegas for the CES, and my wife and I go to a party at Steve Wynn's penthouse, 
But we go to the convention the next day and we go to the Activision booth and Pitfall Harry's there and you can't hear anything because this, these guys in the next booth are playing this music so loud, this rock music with their band, you can't hear. Because Pitfall Harry, he had, they, they had you know, done this nice little soundtrack with sound effects and everything on it. Couldn't hear a thing. And we said to, to, to Bobby, what, what's the deal with this? You know, you can't hear anything. And he said, I don't know, we've gone over there, we've asked them to turn it down and they just won't do it. So about an hour later, Steve Wynn shows up. And <laughs> he's got these two guys with him that are like, you know, it's Vegas, right? These are like palookas. And he walks into the booth and he's looking at it and he goes, I can't hear anything. And Bobby says, yeah, I know these guys in the booth next door, they just won't turn it down. And Steve Wynn turns to his guys and he says, go see about that. And these two guys walk over to the other booth, and about three minutes later, the sound in the booth goes down to like nothing, like <laughs> nothing. And for the next three days, it never went up again. Oh wow! So, good to hear. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, that's that stuff is uh that's fascinating. Then. So. <laughs> So yeah, so you actually, so you're actually at the CES show then, dur yeah. during all of this, and so you get to see the game being demonstrated and everything. Yeah, it was people loved it. You know, that's great. It seems to me. Do you remember the platforms at the time? There was like Super Nintendo, there was like Sega Genesis and all that. And from what I can tell, it was first developed for the Sega machine, with like a second company sort of assisting on uh, the Nintendo version. Did you interact with any of that or any of that stuff ring a bell? No, I did not interact with any of that stuff. You know, once we got done delivering the artwork to uh, to the to Activision, you know, we we showed up. You know, months later when they had implemented it, and you know, as I said, we got to see it in the game. But once we had delivered our artwork, we, we weren't involved anymore. Yeah, I guess that makes and sense. We actually, were really, we, were, we were really busy at the time, and I don't think we ever did another game quite like that. I mean, we did a project called Computer Warriors a couple of years later. For Mattel, but that wasn't really a game. That was based off a toy line that they had. But we never really did another game after the Activision experience because you know we got caught up in all these other projects. I guess Ferngar Ferngully was 1992, I think it was released. Yeah, we and started I... it in. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then Pitfall: The Mine Adventure finally shipped in 1994. So uh, one of the things I noticed from that. Um, I, this is one of the things that really picked up on me because I, I was quite familiar with Ferngully and you look through the manual for the Mayan adventure and you can definitely see the resemblance of the characters there and I thought that was uh, at the time like I didn't I didn't actually put two and two together but I was like oh that looks similar to that film were, were, were the character designs for Pitfall then kind of somewhat inspired by the work on Ferngully then? You know they they may have actually referenced some of the Ferngully styling when they had us do the designs. Yeah, that could have been. That's what I'm but thinking, yeah. You can really see it with some of the hair and some of the flourishes on the clothes and everything, and the, the facial design. It, it, it is very reminiscent of Ferngully. Well, there's always, you know, there's always a, a similarity to certain kinds of 2D animation, you know. Naturally, yeah. And also, you know, I know there, we had a subcontractor in Ferngully, a film, from they were in, de, in a in co in uh, Amsterdam in Holland and uh, they they're still there a film but they they used to do this they used to do these animated features and they would always look the same because they said well look everybody knows how to draw these characters so why don't we just you know keep drawing these characters this way <laughs> because we'll get the production goes a lot faster than people have to learn a new style so that may have had something to do with it they said we'll make them just look a lot like Zach so you can do it faster you know, that, that may have been part of it. I don't remember that though. When you guys delivered the animation to Activision, then I mean, did you did this on paper? Then you say, and then delivered yeah. that, and you just they they took the pencil drawings essentially and scanned them into the computer. Yep, that's how it worked. Okay, yeah. got it. Did you ever have a chance, by the way, uh, or, around a similar time, uh, Sega also released a game based on the film Aladdin, and for that one, uh, they they got actual Disney to work on it. And it seemed like like the trend between Pitfall and that like was to try to pull, um, I guess you could say, like hand drawn animation into the world of video games. 
Uh, did you ever see that game by any chance? I didn't, no. So what's interesting then, and this applies to the film industry as well, is another company then released another big game, Donkey Kong Country it was called, that uh, used computer animated characters. And at the time, everybody was blown away seeing the sort of three-dimensional shapes. But looking back, I feel like the hand-drawn animation of that era holds up a lot better. But it seems like CGI essentially sort of changed the animation industry forever. Uh, what are your thoughts on on that shift from the sort of hand-drawn animation over to, you know, basically what happened with Toy Story and everything and where the industry went from there? Well, you know, the, the feature animation in those days with hand-drawn, uh, it was a pretty exclusive small club of talented people because the ability to animate on paper in 2D is a really, really rare and weird skill that very few people in the population can do. You know? I mean, it's very difficult to draw well and to draw dimensionally and to be able to move and rotate a character in your imagination and have that character appear to maintain solidity. And then on top of that, make the character move believably, and on top of that, add acting to the movement. So the amount of people who can actually do that is pretty small, and those people become extremely dedicated and very skilled. So, you know, I mean, a skilled Disney-style 2D animator, in my opinion, is the peak of the, that's the peak of the peak, you know? I, I agree, yeah. I got into television. Television reduced that down to very flat, shapes that often weren't even that pleasing. They didn't have to really move that well. They didn't have to maintain dimensional volume, and that became very simplistic. But whenever you got a real animator who was used to working dimensionally into any project, you know, they brought that that skill level to it. And, uh, you know, that's why those projects, if you had, if you just had a couple of good animators on it, they, it elevated the project in a tremendous way. Absolutely. And it's still it's still true to this day. Weirdly enough, people don't realize it, but Disney and Pixar and Blue Sky and all these companies maintain they have some two D animators on staff that do animation tests because they can take an idea, they can look at a character design off of off of a drawing, and in two days they can do a pencil test of that thing moving, and everybody can look at it and say, yeah, that looks that's going to work, as opposed to taking you know weeks and weeks to actually build a model and rig a model and you know, wait a while and everything. Right, obviously. So, so the ability to animate is still pretty valuable. And, you know, as, as you've seen in uh, Mary Poppins Returns, you know, there's still a few of those good 2D animators kicking around town and doing really good work. Uh, but it is, a, it, is a, it, is an, it is an art form that is in danger of disappearing, you know, not only because there's not enough uh, financial backing to do high quality 2D animation, but the, the uh, support team, the assistants and the cleanup artists and everything, they have nowhere to work. You know, a good animator who animates in 2D can a lot of times do, do double duty as a CG animator. And a lot of the really good CG animators, you know, James Baxter, you know, they can, they work in both medium. They can draw, but they can also pop over and do CG animation. And so those guys have not had a problem, but the people who clean up their drawings, the drawings you actually see on the screen are done by their assistants. And those people have no role at all in, in the CG animation world. So that entire culture is vanishing. And a hundred years of skilled knowledge going all the way back to flowers and trees, you know, that was a continuous, that's 90 years almost exactly flowers and trees, 19, you know, wow. 1929, right? You go, you take that, knowledge being passed down the skill of the assistant and the in-betweener and the cleanup artist those people that backed up the animator you know because those rough animation drawings they're good but they're not what you see in the screen you know it's that other group of artists that do that and that whole group is they're vanishing because there's no work and so there's only a f literally a handful of them even left and it's really a sad sad thing because if they when they retire or disappear and they haven't trained anybody young to do that that's almost puts like a death knell on the on the 2d animation world it's um it's, it's very sad to think about that it's a very strange thing because of so when i grew up you know i grew up in the 80s and 90s and when i was younger i spent a lot of time doing this i was really into drawing and animation 
but for that was like my dream was to become like an animator at some point but then i feel like the computer hit it just just the time where it kind of pulled my attention away and with things like toy story hitting it just felt like everything was changing but i feel like 10 years earlier that's, that would have been something that i really would have loved to have gotten into so it is well ironic, ironically you know there's a it, 2d has had a huge comeback in the television business because probably half or more of the series that are running on netflix and cartoon network and nickelodeon and disney television are 2d you know they're hand drawn and so drawing and fun drawing and fun animation drawing has made a gigantic comeback and there's and there's more people working today in the animation industry in hollywood than have ever worked in the business wow matter of fact i just read the other day the union has over 4500 members now you know i mean it had 900 when i was you know working and and dreamworks television went from 80 to 800 in three years Oof. and so the 2D animation industry, in that respect, is 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 thriving, but that's not the same as the Disney style 2D full animation thing. You know, I mean, the Loud House is not like you know, Sword in the Stone. It's just, just right. the animation yeah. scale is not. You can see it's not quite the same thing. So Most that's kind of a quandary here. You know, um, I am curious though. When do you recall the first time that you actually, so you were doing hand animation, like solely hand animation, but then there was a point where the computer entered into the equation. Like, do you remember what it was like the first time you saw a computer being used for any sort of animation? Uh, and like, you know, I'm just curious. I can't really put in my head like what that was at the time in terms of like seeing the potential of the computer as an animation tool. Well, Tron was, you know, that was oh, right. the... That was the landmark of that. I mean, Tron was the very first time anybody did computer animation on the big screen, and it was just a total fluke that I was in the middle of that. You know, we developed Tron actually to be a hand animated feature film in which we were going to backlight all the animation, and that's how we were going to make it look electronic. But there were people doing computer animation that looked extremely primitive. It was like TV logos and very simple, you know, cube things. But Steve Lisberger saw that and he said, I really think we can, I think we can make this movie. I think we can make it, you know, happen. And so on a huge leap of faith, you know, he designed the movie and then Disney, only because they had this young executive named Tom Wilhite who really wanted to do something different. He, he personally like talked Disney into doing the movie. And so we went in there, but when we started Tron, you know, none of the technology that you see on the screen two years later existed when we started the movie, you know, like none of the software to do that. Even, you know, these, in those days, computer companies, they actually built their own hardware. They didn't share hardware. There wasn't any Maya. There was no Silicon graphics. You know, That's there was right. no, it was all, you know, custom made stuff. So that was the toughest thing is being a, an animator on Tron. I had to work with the four major computer companies and uh, the, uh, who were the only ones in the United States who could even do anything for on film. And all four of them had totally different software packages and totally different methodologies. And we had to look at what they could do. And then we had this strange back and forth where we'd go to them with a storyboard and say, can you do this? And they'd go, oh, no way. We'd say, well, what can you do? And they'd say, we can do that. We'd go, okay. So we'd change the storyboard and we'd do that. And that's how Tron was made. And, you know, Tron, you know, I only worked on a, com literally worked on a computer in the last fourth of the production. And I just used the computer to view what the guys programmed because there was no interactive imagery in those days on a computer. You know, you couldn't see a line test on a computer in 1981. There's no such thing. You know, you couldn't see, uh, you know, you couldn't, there was no graphics pipeline. You had to essentially generate and look at an end result. Is that how it was, basically? Yeah, I would write, yeah you, would, you would design the models on, mm -hmm. as diagrams on paper, and then they would build them, and they'd show them to you as rendered images, and you'd approve them and tweak them. And then for the animation, it was all done on graph paper. And we, I mean, we figured out all the movement on graph paper, and then we had to write exposure sheets and you literally, the way you did it, there was no animation software. The way you did a scene was you gave them 
24 coordinates for the 24 frames and they rendered the bike 24 times in 24 different locations and that's how you got one second of movement so that's for incredible. 90, so for four, a four second scene i had to write 96 lines of coordinates <sighs> xyz yaw pitch roll you know so 180,000 individual numbers that we wrote and were typed into the computer, and that's how Tron was made. And I never saw anything move until a 70 millimeter line test. <laughs> so I would take a storyboard, I would look at the motion, I would get out of a, a gra I, I would, you know, and this is why you had to be a Disney animator, because you know, I had to be able to visualize. Because <laughs> when I'm storyboarding, I'm literally seeing exactly what I want, and I can imagine exactly what it's gonna be. And then I take out graph paper and I figure, okay, I got the two bikes moving next to each other and they go this far and then they turn like this and they turn at frame 28 or whatever. And then I would go ahead and I would program out what those numbers were and I'd write them out and I'd send them off to the computer company and then a guy would sit there and type them all in and then they would render that and then they'd put that on a Selco film recorder and they would record the imagery onto a film. Onto film because there was no other way to look at it in motion. Then they would develop the film and send it to Hollywood, and then we'd put it on, this, go on the soundstage, stick it on the projector, and we'd look at it. And that was the very, very, very first time we would see the scene move. So and then you, you would take that, could, you essentially could composite that with the, uh, just the film? You, that was just to tell you if the motion was right. And usually we got one chance to revise it. So you'd go back into your exposure sheets and you'd change a few numbers and change a few speeds, and then that would be it. And then they'd just render that in color on film, and that was the scene. That's and amazing. That's, so all of Tron is basically the, the first take or the second take. You know, nowadays in, in special effects and visual effects, you can do 100, it's not unusual to see 180 takes of a visual effects scene. A tr the entire movie Tron, there's no, I don't think there's a single scene in there that had more than three versions. I just gave this lecture um, in October to the D Walt Disney Feature Animation Effects Department because the guys over there, they said, you know, we feel this is part of our heritage, you know, because you did this at Disney Feature Animation. And we'd be like, can you come over and tell us how you do it? Because no one can remember how you do it, did it. So I came over and I, I went in the Disney theater into this packed house. I told, I showed all the Disney, the young Disney guys today how we did Tron and they could not believe it. They could not believe it. I mean, it, it's like a handmade computer animated film. That's, and, a, uh, it's unbelievable to consider it. Cause yeah, you really, it sounds like you just have to have that vision of what it can be because you can't make mistakes. There was no hunt and peck boy. I mean, you had to have it all. <laughs> Well, that, but that's the, that's the nature of a hand-drawn 2D animator, you know. It's so much work to draw a scene. When you sit down at an animation desk with a stack of paper and you're going to draw a scene, that is a lot of work. You don't just start drawing. You know, you sit there and you think about it and you take little thumbnails and you sketch little ideas for poses and then you, you know, you really, and when you sit down to animate, you already know what you're doing. And when you get done animating that scene on paper, you can flip it, right? Right in front of you. I mean, you're not guessing. And so when you send that off to camera, you're basically 95% sure that you've done what you intended to do. And then when the pencil test comes back, you look at it and you maybe pick out, change one frame here, change one frame there, change. But you know, you've basically done all the visualization first and that was the skill set required for Tron. I mean, if we didn't have that movie 98% already figured out in our heads before we sat down to figure out how to translate that to the computer, we never could have gotten that movie done because there was no ability to redo anything. You couldn't yeah. retake it. So anyway, that was one of the bizarre and kind of fascinating things. So as much as you might pick at the motion in Tron, I actually think it mostly looks pretty darn good. You know? Yeah, no, I actually, especially today, I look look back on it. And I think it has a, a unique aesthetic that, uh, that I quite like. It's, it holds up. And you can really appreciate it more knowing exactly like how it was made and understanding the restrictions. So yeah, you guys did a tremendous job on that. And <laughs> remember, all the camera moves are done that's that way too. They're all done in our head. You couldn't see the camera moves, right? Yeah, yeah, you had, yeah right. You had to basically hand write everything where it was going to be with 
it's crazy yeah wow yeah because i mean today you can plan all this stuff out and just play around with it in a virtual space and so yeah that's that's uh that's really impressive that's actually a problem that i think students and young animators have now is you give them a scene and instead of thinking about it they just sit down and start screwing around you know they just start moving things on the computer and because um, they can redo it infinitely it's no it's no effort you know you can just Try set a couple of keyframes and watch it play. If you don't like that? You change, move the keyframes, change the curves. You can just watch it happen. They don't sit first and think, you know, okay, you know, how, what would be a good way to make this work? And I think that's probably a, in the end, a disadvantage, because, um, you know, that's one of the things about using thumbnail, thumbnail sketches, and thinking out your scene is the whole art of designing a scene, you know, graphically so that the poses you're moving into and out of have complementary design that also addresses the emotion of the gesture and the expression. You know, that's, that's the kind of the artistry of it because the art of animation is the art of movement. And unlike a live actor whose only kind of like mandate is to get across the emotion of the character. The animator is getting across the emotion of the character, but with movement that is completely imagined from a fantasy world. And so the animator doesn't have a real body to work with, you know. He has the ability to artfully use the illusion of a body and to move it in a graceful and impossible way. And that's where you really take advantage of the art. That's where you kick live action's ass, you know, <laughs> where you can, you can make it act in a way that's absolutely as effective, but with a, with a, with a movement that people can't take their eyes off of because, you know, it's not real. You know, if you look at an animated, a good animated character with, you know, how, who, well, who looks at Dick Van Dyke in the penguin scene and the Mary Poppins, does anybody ever, that guy could have had his fly down and nobody would have noticed, you know, they're all watching the penguins. And when Gene Kelly danced with, you know, with, uh, you know, with, with Tom, the little mouse, when, or Jerry, when in Anchors Away, who's watching Gene Kelly? They're all watching the animated mouse. Why? Because Gene Kelly, he's a human being. You know what he can do. If the mouse is animated, he can do anything. So you can't take your eyes off the animated character because he's doing stuff that not only could nobody actually do, but it's pretty amazing to watch. And that's always been the... The magic you know of animation yeah absolutely that's it's just phenomenal stuff and it's neat how it's i mean it really has expanded out um the world of games now i mean that's kind of what i what i do a lot of these days uh, covering that stuff so uh it's almost an infinite canvas there as well i mean you can implement any of these techniques into games these days and we do we're starting to see sort of a a younger generation of developers that grew up with a lot of that stuff that want to bring back uh, animation in this way. There's a lot of 2D art that's still happening again. So I feel like um, it's an interesting time, a very rich time in the history for animation work in general. You're right. <clears throat> and I think the emerging technologies are an entire other palette, you know, because you're going to be bringing characters into your own world with augmented reality and virtual reality. And, you know, I've, if you've ever encountered a gigantic animated character in a virtual reality space it's oh, yes i have it's really something different i know the dreamworks guys have this thing where they put the goggles on you with toothless and um the dragon from how to train your dragon and being in the space with this big kind of dangerous looking creature is just physiologically does something to you you know Absolutely. Something, something you don't get by looking at the big screen. So uh, that's an entire other world to explore that's pretty exciting. You know, I, I don't know how many VR movies you've watched. You've probably watched a lot. But, you know, like Age of Sail that John Carr's just did, the one about the, you know, the old sailor and the girl that falls off the ship. Yeah. You know, you, you watch that on the screen, and it's a, it's a good, it's a nice movie. But I admit, you know, you put those goggles on, you stand on the deck with those people, and you stand there and look back and forth as they argue with each other, there's a different feeling to that, you know? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Just, it's a different vibe. And um, 
you know, it's 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 the most exciting. It's a very exciting time. It, right now, it reminds me of the Tron days because when we did Tron, that was the very beginning of computer graphics. You know, that was how it all. That was when it started to unfold, and then, you know. The 80s were the, that was the golden age of computer graphics when you know the mid 80s when John Lasseter did you know first he did Andre and Wally B and then he followed up with Luxo Jr. and that really blew open the possibilities of wow computers can do character animation and you know that was when um, the excitement was really happening when all the discoveries were being made to do photo reality and do and have an animation software that you could actually tweak that was the very exciting time and then. And then it got so ubiquitous, you know, everybody was doing it, and anybody could do anything, that it almost started to get a little boring. But now it's kind of, that excitement is back with emerging technologies, because with these new mediums, you know, um, and nobody's figured it out, the sky's the limit, you know, it's it's a pretty exciting time. Yeah, that's great. So, and thinking of that then, I mean, what is your favorite era to have worked in? I mean, you've been through many eras of animation then. I mean, is it the exciting moment of now or is there a specific time that you look back on and feel like this was the time I enjoyed being in the industry the most? I have to say, and you know, nothing will ever compare to those beginning days training with the old men at Disney. You know, it was the most pure, direction you know there was nothing else to think of in the world there was nothing else in the world that was a higher calling you know there was no other kind of animation greater than disney feature animation at that time and to be at disney with the guys who had done it the old guys and to be working with these guys like brad bird and john lasseter and and tim burton and all these guys sitting around you that were eventually going to go on and become superstars but even at the time you could tell we're, we're geniuses you know and to be able to sit there and spend the whole day drawing and learning and having you know animal drawing lessons in the sound stages and life drawing lessons and being purely devoted to becoming a great animator there's nothing like that it was like being with Leonardo da Vinci all day and you know it was I have to say it was really and the other thing about it was animating in 2D, to me, was the, you know, you experience that thing they call, you know, going into the zone, you know, right. where you literally forget everything. You're so immersed in the work that you're literally living in the scene and you don't even notice what's happening around you. And that's a, that's a, this transcendent feeling. It's almost like being on drugs that, you know, really good animators, everybody has that experience. And I... I do not have that experience animating in CG as much, and I think it's a little bit because there's enough of a technical barrier between you and what you're doing, you know. Whereas when you're just flipping paper and drawing, there's no technical barrier, you know. Right. Your hand moving as drawing isn't even something you think about. It's not a hot key, you know. It's not like a mouse or anything. It's just you're just. You're, it's going right from your brain onto the paper. And so that's when you go into this other state, this beautiful transcendent state. And, um, you know, I have to say, there's, it's a really special thing. You know, I still have my animation desk here, my Disney animation desk. I'm sitting oh. right there and with my stacks of white blank drawing paper up there. And, you know, that's my plan is to get back into animating on paper again and, just start doing that again because it's um, there's really nothing like it, you know. I mean, I kind of resist. I, I draw digitally now, obviously exclusively, you know, and I'm working. But right. I really, really miss the paper, <laughs> and so I think I'm going to try to get back into that. Oh, that would be so excellent. Again, yeah. Do you th do you see uh, with you know since you're at a university essentially? I mean, do you see any students taking an interest in actually? trying their hand at paper again well my students all try their hand at paper because oh, i require it that's my excellent first semester the beginning animation at my school we have traditional animation life boards and everybody animates on paper for the for one semester they're required to oh, i want to give them the experience i want to give them the experience of flipping and 
not having any crutch, you know, no digital crutch. Everything you do has to come out of your own head. And um, every animator that I've ever told that to says to me, thank God you're doing that. And then uh, we allow them to continue on paper as long as they want. You know, second semester, they have their choice. They can stay on paper or they can switch to the Cintiq, but it's up to them. And, uh, you know, really most people switch over to the Cintiq, to tell you the truth, which is too bad. But you never know, you know. Uh, I mean, I will say that I have a lot. I have majority of my kids now, you know, um, when I started nine years ago, everybody was assuming Pixar was the Pixar CG animation thing was the future. Now, the majority of my students are looking at really 2D because of the television boom. Oh, that's great. I have, I have more and more students, you know, drawing and, I have, and drawing well. So that's a good sign. But the idea is to try to spark in students the idea that, you know, there's timeless principles and those are still appealing to people. And that's what you have to tap into. Everybody has it. Every, everybody should have an individual vision that is a little bit different from everybody else's, you know. And the computer, I think, fights against that. It, the computer almost guides you towards standardization. And, it's the, and so we try to have everybody work without a computer because then what they do is really what they do. And that's what you try to awaken. And this, with with where we are at now, do you think there's any market for like a big budget feature film that, where the the hook is to go back and do it completely with hand drawn animation, like from paper, and you know completely get rid of the modern methods? Well, not necessarily completely, but you know tr try to do it the traditional way. Well, I, I absolutely think there is. I mean, I'd love to see that. You gotta, gotta realize that you know in Japan, you know, so hand drawn features over there. You know, are the standard thing, and they're and they're still hand drawn. And you know, obviously, you want to use digital to make your life easy to do painting and everything. You don't want to paint. You know, have cell vinyl paint. But uh, you know, you can absolutely. Uh, you know, somebody just has to make somebody. As soon as somebody does a hand drawn feature here that makes a lot of money, Hollywood will jump on the bandwagon because that's what they do. It's like Brad Bird always says, Hollywood's like a dumb shark. They just follow the blood. <laughs> and so you just if somebody you know. Princess and the Frog was a really good movie. It just wasn't really marketed that well. And, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a movie called Persepolis. Oh, yes, you know, absolutely. It's gorgeous. I mean, that's a movie that has a great, really cool graphic style. It was pretty yeah, I love that. perfect for the medium. So, you know, you, you it's somebody is going to hit upon an interesting 2D animated style that's exactly right for the story. And it's going to touch an audience. I hope somebody does anyway. I just hope somebody does that and gets animation back in the, in the mainstream. You know, I just hope that happens because uh, it's a shame to see 2D feature animation um, fritter away. You know, that's just yeah, there's, they're just they're wonderful things. I still watch them regularly. Actually, a lot of films from back in back in the day. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Well, you know, I. I suppose I've probably taken up enough of your time since we're coming up on here on an hour. So, <laughs> okay, well, it was good talking to you. Yeah, no, well, thank thank you so much, Bill. That was that was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for sharing all that information, and uh, yeah, good luck uh, going forward. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm.